I'm not someone who walks into a room with entitlement. I never have. I have built every opportunity and I have worked on every achievement that I've had myself. So I never expected to rest on my laurels. I never do. Welcome to Imposters, a podcast from The Telegraph. Have you ever had that creeping feeling that you don't belong somewhere or that you don't deserve your success? even though you know deep down that's not true? Yeah, me too. I'm Claire Cohen, The Telegraph's women's editor and co-founder of our Women Mean Business initiative. In this podcast, we square up to imposter syndrome and demand to know what its deal is. In each episode, I talk to a woman who is out there carving a successful career in a challenging industry, whether that's food or film, fashion, or even flying to the moon. I want to know if they've ever experienced imposter syndrome. If so, what convinced them to keep going anyway? If not, what's their secret? So without further ado, let's meet this week's imposter. My guest today is an actress, model, producer, entrepreneur, activist, philanthropist and author. In other words, she's a bit of a superstar. In 2000, she was crowned Miss World, and in the two decades since then, she's made more than 60 films, both in India and the US. In 2016, she was named one of Time magazine's 100 Most Influential People. And in November 2020, she became the British Fashion Council's new ambassador for positive change. Frankly, she has the sort of CV that someone twice her age would be proud of. As well as that, she's known for her bold risk-taking and willingness to speak out so it's hard to imagine she has ever doubted herself. Let's find out. Welcome to Imposters, Priyanka Chopra Jonas. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Claire. It's so nice to be here. How does it feel to hear somebody list even a few of your achievements like that? Are you sat there thinking, yes, I did that? Or is a little part of you cringing? Definitely cringing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, just to see it listed out like that. I mean, not because I'm not proud of it. Of course, I'm very proud of it. But it just it I don't I don't see myself like that. I don't see um, myself wearing all those medals of honor. Um, You know, I'm just a girl really trying to navigate the business of entertainment. I'm just trying to, you know, push the needle for myself. And I think along the way, um, a lot of wonderful things have happened to me. And, um, and that's why it's a little cringy. <laughs> so you're now an author and you've written a memoir called Unfinished, which gives readers an insight into your childhood in India, your teenage years in the US and all your success that came after. Did writing a book feel like just another thing you could do? Or were you really nervous about doing it? No one can just do anything, you know, Claire. I mean, but if you don't try something for the first time, then you'll never know. And that's sort of my attitude with life in general. If I was always waiting to be prepared, I would have never done half the things that I have, um, including my entire career would have never happened because I was kind of thrown into the deep end um, in the arts. I wanted to be in science. So, you know, it, it, I think that's something I learned very early in my life of just sort of navigating and um, quickly being able to um, learn from whatever circumstances you've been thrown into. And that's what I did with the book. I learned, I worked with my co-author who taught me how to structure the book. I I thought about, you know, the books that I loved reading, what I liked in other memoirs that I have loved. I really love um, reading vivid storytelling, you know, um, in all the books that I like, I love them being descriptive. I like to know tastes and smells. And, um, so that's what I try to do with my writing. Um, I've always been very curious about writing and excited about it. And I hope to expand that into, um, you know, into various kinds of writing. It starts with a memoir, who knows, you know, maybe a screenplay. So why did now feel like a good moment for you to be introspective? Well, one, because I wrote it predominantly during quarantine and, you know, we were all at home and my schedule wasn't pulling me in seven different directions. And um, I had the quiet time to be able to look inside of me and really access, you know, my journey and access my feelings, my failures, my rejections. Um, And I was comfortable enough as a woman 
confident in my abilities professionally and personally that the insecurities of my past didn't daunt me as much as, you know, I would have expected them to. Um, but I do think that if it wasn't for quarantine and I didn't have that time and I wasn't feeling vulnerable, just like everybody else in the world, I don't think this book would have been the same. You mentioned rejections and failures, and I'm sorry, but we are going to come back to those. <laughs> but let's start with insecurity, because if we turn the clock back to a very young Priyanka, you have before described her as somebody who suffered with insecurity. What was at the root of that? I mean, growing up, isn't it? Everyone, while you're growing up, is insecure about various things, who you are, what you want to be, um, you know, all the information that is being thrown at you as a teenager from all these different directions. You know, you're becoming a woman. People look at you differently. It's just, I was just navigating um, all of those things. So I think insecurity in the way I looked, insecurity in the way I spoke, insecurity in the fact that I was just always different whenever I was in the room, you know. Um, I, I was never one to fit in or blend in. And I always kind of stood out. Sometimes I chose to stand out. Sometimes even when I didn't choose to stand out, I did. Um, it just seemed to be the common theme of my life for some reason. And it took a really long time for me to realize that that would be my strength and not my weakness. And if I was afraid, I would break down and I would cry and build myself up again. I just have had that nature, I think. And that always made me stand out. In your book, you do address one particularly painful episode when you were a child and you were I was going to say sent to boarding school, but you were essentially left at boarding school. That must have been a huge kind of wrench for you and maybe also a building block in terms of that confidence and independence you now have. I think I was in third grade and um, turned into a brat, single child, and my brother was born. And I don't know, I became demonic. <laughs> that's about seven years old. Is that right? Yes, that's about seven years old. And I was just, I started behaving terribly and acting out. And at that time, my parents were both in the military. And at that time, a lot of military kids were sent to boarding school for, you know, normalcy because parents would constantly be moving, you know, um, somebody would be posted somewhere and, you know, you go to boarding school. But at three years, like at, in third grade, at seven years old, when I was sort of dropped there, I don't think I understood what it was. All I remember feeling was feeling abandoned feeling angry um, at myself, at trying to think about what I did wrong, blaming myself. And all of the, that, that period went on for the first year specifically. Um, those are all the feelings that I remember are all completely scary and, you know, overwhelming. But over time, by the second or the third year, which is like fourth or fifth grade, eight, nine, I had tasted independence you know, I had tasted doing things on my own. So when I went back home after three years of being in boarding school, the other girls were so basic in my head because I was like, you don't know about life. I have lived alone. I am a grown up, you know, I approached life from a completely different way. And look, there, there are both ways of thinking about it. I could have held on to the feeling of, you know, uh, abandonment and fear and anger. But when I came back home from boarding school, I was surrounded by so much love and affection that I didn't even think about that. All I thought about was how grown up I was and how cool I was because I had street cred from being in boarding school and coming back. And, you know, it was those were the teenage thoughts at that point. I don't know if they're teenage thoughts. I think that's quite a mature lesson to have learned at that young age. But I think it is It is a testament to my parents being very aware of what I needed when I came back home. You know, uh, because I had been away, they consciously chose to be around me and be inclusive of me and be encouraging of me and loving. And, and I think that helped me ease away all the fears that had been built and I didn't hold on to them as an adult. So let's jump forward a bit, Priyanka. You went to live in the US as a teenager and then you came back to India and in the year 2000, you were crowned Miss World in the Millennium Dome in London, no less. And suddenly, I think it's fair to say, your ambitions probably changed. One minute you were studying to become an engineer, the next minute you're Miss World. So how did it feel to be suddenly plunged into this world of beauty pageants that all the other girls taking part had been doing, presumably, for years and years. 
and that places a really high value on looks, which isn't something you were used to at all? Well, first of all, it was not even someone who was studying engineering. Think about it this way. I was in high school. Remind yourself what you were like at 17, 16 in high school. Oh my God, I prefer not to remember. (laughs) That's where I was as someone who, of course, I had teenage vanity and I really liked wearing, you know, the coolest clothes. And um, I just about discovered what it was like to, you know, wear makeup. And, you know, I was, I was sort of understanding my expression uh, in terms of just as a teenager. Uh, And suddenly I was thrown into this new world Two things that I think I recognize about myself. One, I was competitive. So if you throw me into anything, I'm going to aim to win. And the way I do that is I'll listen, I'll learn, I quickly keep my head above water. I'm not one to go down. You know, I'm always someone who like try and swim. Um, And that's what I did. I jumped in and I was like, all right, what can I learn? I didn't think about the pressure, I think, of this new world, I just wanted to win. But when I was sent to boarding school, when I was um, in uh, America um, for high school, it was pretty much the same thing, being thrown into a completely different world and learning to navigate it. And I'd sort of done that since I was a child because my parents were both in the military. We moved around every two years. So new school, new friends, adaptability was a sense of adventure for me. It was curious. And that never daunted me. I think I didn't realize what I'd been thrown into for many years after I had just been running. I just went boots on the ground. You know, I just ran, 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 ran. Okay, this pageant, the next pageant, movies, starting to figure out how do you even act, like learning that. Um, You know, just everything was new. And all I did was try to survive. So acting jobs started coming your way, but you knew, I think it's fair to say, nothing about making films. So what was it like walking onto that first film set and knowing you had to both learn on the job while desperately trying not to look like you didn't know what you were doing? Um, I love that you asked me that question because it's so true. Uh, It was expected that movies would be offered to, you know, um, international beauty pageant winners. The Miss World, Miss Universe, Miss India was at that time, at the turn of the millennium, like a, a thing. We used to watch the pageants all the time, be very excited about them. Um, so it was expected that, you know, movies would go to the new Miss World. It would be the acting debut. And that's what happened to me. So I was just, I guess, expected to know what I was doing. <laughs> you know, know how to learn the lines, walk onto a mark, make sure you don't cast a shadow on your face, make sure like 400 people are watching you, but you're not daunted by it. It was insane. Um, And at like 19, 18, I was working with really prolific actors and people that I had watched growing up on my TV was suddenly my co-actor. And it was all insane. But I think... I did the same thing, which is I just swam and I just swam really fast. I, I took lessons. I, I never left set and went to the trailer. Like I would, I'm all, it's still a habit that I have. I always sit on set. I just listen to why people make decisions. I'm, I'm in a constant sta- state of learning. And I think that's what I did even then. Um, but I remember crying um, after the first few days of being on set and like, crying to my mom and saying, I don't want to do it. You know, I come at nine o'clock in the morning and my co-actor comes so late and I always have to sit in hair and makeup and I have to wait. And it was too much as a 19 year old. And my mom just told me, she was like, you know what? You've signed two or three movies. Finish your contract because you're a woman of her word. And then if you don't want to do it, go back to school. It's not a big deal. Like my parents just took away that pressure of what happens if I fail from me. So then I just had fun. And a couple of movies later, I was like, oh, okay, this is good. I'm going to do this. I was really struck, actually, by some of the boundaries you set really early on in your career. So in your first movies, you asked for a pay rise because your male co-star was being paid so much more. And then on the next film, you actually walked off set Mm -hmm. because you were basically being treated like a sex object. 
Could you give our listeners a little bit of context as to what actually happened there? Well, it was a movie I was doing and the director sort of saw me not for the artist that I am um, in a couple of things that he said, but he just saw me as like an object for titillation in a way. And he said something um, to my um, stylist and said that she should be dressed, you know, I should be able to see her panties because otherwise who's going to come and watch the movie? And it was, it was just degrading um, that I was reduced to just that. It just made me feel bad about who I was. I mean, you hear A-list Hollywood actresses now saying, even at this point in their careers, oh, I don't want to make those calls because I don't want to be seen as looking difficult. What gave you the confidence to do that at that young age? I don't even think I did properly, did I? Like, I never told that director when I walked out of the movie why I walked out of it. Because of the same thing. We are told to work within the system. And we work within the system because that's the only way to go forward now. 20 years later, I'm being able to talk about it because I have a sense of self and I can stand on my own feet and say, you know, I'm not that girl anymore and I'm not afraid. But I was a victim of it too, of this system that exists, this glass ceiling of you know, behavior for for women, for demands. And, you know, she's too ambitious or she's too demanding. And I think it took me a really long time to find my own sense of self as a woman in the industry, as a a person, um, and as someone who has dreams and desires and ambitions. I'm fiercely ambitious and I'm not going to be apologetic for it anymore. And it took me many, many years to get to that place. So how do you handle those situations now when it comes to being paid equally in the films you're doing? Well, I think I've reached a point in my life where I've got enough credibility for what I bring to the table for people to recognize that, you know, Um, and um, for me to not have it be um, sort of an entitled struggle anymore. Um, But it's taken, like I said, 20 years to get there of, you know, constantly working and constantly, consistently proving my worth um, to now where, you know, people offer it to me. And um, and I feel grateful for that. But I know, you know, I'm an anomaly. There are so many girls who have worked for such a long time, but still get don't get to be at a place where they're seen as equal And that's going to be our generation's fight. That's what we as women are going to do for our next generation. They will not inherit our problems because we will be aware of them and fix them in our time. And that's how I see it. So a few years ago, you broke America. And it seems like that was actually a huge challenge. I guess outwardly, To the rest of us, it looked pretty seamless. But it must have been quite strange for you because in India, you were really famous. You'd made more than 50 films there. And yet in the US, you were totally unknown. You kind of had to start again. Was that really frustrating for you? Did you have to just sort of swallow your pride and accept that basically you were an imposter? I'm not someone who walks into a room with entitlement. I never have. I have built every opportunity and I have worked on every... Um, achievement that I've had myself. So I never expected to rest on my laurels. I never do. Um, Just because I have had a hit film doesn't mean I should expect that the next movie and the next movie will be loved by everyone. So in the same way, it was my choice to pivot to America, try doing music, something I'd never done before, um, you know, in a country that I had never looked for work in before. Yes, of course, it required swallowing pride. And of course, it required me, you know, walking into parties where, you know, no one knew me or walking into magazine offices where, you know, I'd been on their Indian covers six times, but I still had to say, hi, I'm Priyanka. You know, I've been on your Indian cover many times, but this is the person I am and this is what I'm looking to do. And that's okay. I think we have to, again, make people understand and feel like it's okay to try anything new at any given time, as long as you treat it with the respect it deserves. I didn't walk in here expecting to be, you know, um, getting the biggest of movies and the biggest of roles. I'm now, after working in America for almost six years, just about doing my first 
role as a leading lady in a feature film, just about doing my first part as a dramatic part in a, in a feature, you know? So it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of breaking down doors, especially when I came to Hollywood. It was so funny. What I realized was, I don't think it's in people's consciousness to see a brown person being the lead of a mainstream TV show or a movie. When I first started six six years ago, it was not normal to be like, all right, lead of something mainstream, not genre, not indie, not a check in the box, not a friend, but the lead in a mainstream show. And that was my struggle. I came in at a time where I was like, I'm going to, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be a check in the box. And, you know, I worked in that direction and it, it required re-educating people. It required, um, you know, walking into uncomfortable situations. It required demanding and creating opportunities um, and being bold. And, you know, it took a bit, but I'm at a place where um, I'm just about starting to do the kind of work that I was looking for when I came to America all those years ago. And when you did first come to America all those years ago, you started out having a singing career. And I think you tried that for about three years and it didn't really take off. How hard was it for you to give that up? Did you feel like you'd failed? A hundred percent, of course. I didn't have to give it up at that point because, you know, we had like 40 songs ready and an entire album ready. And But I did a couple of singles and I kind of felt short of my own artistic self. Um, I have very high standards for for what I deliver so when it falls short of what you're trying to do, you know, as an artist, that's that's a failure. And I always see it as um, as something that I kind of gave up on. But I also believe that it's okay to do that. My book is called Unfinished. That's another reason for why it's called Unfinished, because I've left a lot of things behind that didn't have any merit in my life going forward. You know, I tried it and, you know, it gave me another trajectory. I started seeking, um, you know, acting in the U.S., which was something I would have never thought about if I hadn't done the music and if I hadn't come here. And, um, you know, I was very happy with the work that I was doing in India. So I believe everything happens for a reason and you just have to navigate life the best you can and, you know, kind of seek excellence in the moment and the rest will just fall into place. So during both of those times that you were first in the States, when you were at high school and then when you went back to try and make it as a singer there, you experienced racist abuse and you were made to feel somehow other. Probably, I'm thinking, for the first time in your life. How did that impact your confidence? Um, I was made to feel other because of, you know, my ethnicity, which was very different. That I, I was always another. I was always different, you know, and it was something that I used to be insecure about, but eventually realized it was my strength. But just my ethnicity was some, it was so bizarre to me that, you know, that, um, especially in school, that that could hurt so much. But I have to say that what happened to me, I got away with, in without, you know, as much hurt as a lot of people do. People have faced extreme racism, bullying, brutality, because of being different. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky and blessed that I was surrounded by enough support and love for that to not affect me as much as it could have. Um, but it's so uncool. Like, there's no other way of explaining it. It's like bullying is abuse of power. And um, racism is just basic stupidity. Like, it's, it's, it's so primal to me as a thought um, you know, it's it's medieval almost, and we need to m walk forward. How can we differentiate people based on their skin or where they come from? It's crazy to me. You know, we are one species of people. So the way I see it is, you know, we have to we have to be able to have these discussions and you know call out um, when these things happen and be a debate and be a conversation and make sure that that conversation is loud enough for us to create that change. Do you ever think that, if, you know, if I could just go back and say something to them now, like, look how far I've come? Well, I would have, at this point in my life, maybe not in my 20s, in my 20s, I would have probably been like, 
yeah, look how far I've come, bitch. <laughs> but now in my 30s as a more mature person, <laughs> I would probably sit her down and be like, all right, let's sit down for a cup of coffee. What is the real problem? What is your issue? And now I would have gotten below the surface, but in my 20s, probably not. <laughs> it's interesting you talk about the difference between your 20s and your 30s. Because that's something I've read you sort of do quite often, differentiating between those two decades in your life. And you've spoken about how 20s Priyanka was quite impulsive. I want to know what impulsive Priyanka looks like. I mean, I'm, I'm always, I've always been my own person. And, you know, I walk to the tune of my drum. I just always have. But in my 20s, it was a lot more. I mean... I was just never answerable to anyone or anything. You know, I would do what I want, when I wanted, how I wanted. Um, I would pick up and travel whenever I wanted. Um, I would drive my car at two o'clock in the morning, loan whenever I wanted. I was just like very free and impulsive. <laughs> I would walk away from things, you know, walk into things just without really giving it much thought. I was like the road runner almost, you know, just like constantly going um, and I found a sense of balance in the next decade. And it really did happen in my 30s where I felt a sense of like I didn't need to run so fast to feel the rush that um, I guess I was looking for. You've also said that now in your 30s, you've learned to walk out of the house as the woman you want the world to see. And of course, I immediately wondered what it is you don't want the world to see. Well, being a public person for more than half my life, there's a lot I don't want the world to see. I'm not for public consumption, just because my job is public, um, you know, but it's a, it's the part and parcel of making the deal with the devil, I guess. And, you know, it's, um, it's a part of my job. So there's a lot that I keep to myself. I mean, you know, there's been so much that has been written about me over the years that has people have written books about me um, and uh, people who have known me and my trajectory so far may think that they know me, but people don't. And I will always protect that side of me. To me, my day is divided into two, my work day and my home day, and they don't meet. What happens at work stays during my work time, and what happens at home stays here. And those are two different people, and uh, they're two different aspects of me, and I don't like them colliding. I like to make sure they're compartmentalized so that I can enjoy them both. Having two different versions of yourself, one for home and one for work, sounds to me absolutely exhausting. Do you find it hard to compartmentalize like that? Oh my gosh, it's actually the opposite. I think it's completely the opposite. That's what makes me not exhausted. That's because the pressures of my work can be so daunting because of the fact that, you know, I live in a very transient job. My job is not a nine to five where, you know, you know, you're going to get your check every, at the end of the month. It's like, what's the next thing? You know, it's constantly hustling. And if I brought that pressure at home, when I'm sitting down for dinner and thinking about, you know, the numbers of what movies done well and the pressure of who I have to call, then I would never be able to have a spirit which inspires me to create so in fact, having this bifurcation has made it so easy for me to prioritize. And I think when you prioritize your life, it's so simple. When, it, when it's cluttered, it's, it's, that's when it's difficult and exhausting. It sounds to me like you're someone who really enjoys being in control takes one to no one. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'd never, I never lied about that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're having a bad day like that, do you have a sort of inner critic a voice in your head? And if so, what does it say to you? Yeah, that, you know, um, that I may not be good enough. And that's something everyone feels, you know. Whatever your ambition in life might be, there are days where you're like, oh my gosh, am I not good enough for this job? Or am I not good enough for this dress? Or am I not good enough for this position? Or, you know, anything. It's It's being in, being insecure and allowing yourself to be insecure, I think, is the first step to getting over the insecurity. Um, I feel all the things that, you know, any normal girl, any any girl would feel. And I feel all the things. And I why I suggest talking about it to whoever your closest person is, 
because somehow when you talk about insecurities, they just disappear. Like you, you somehow have the ability to not see them as large as they seem when you're dealing with it alone in your mind, right before you go to bed, you know, you're feeling sad and it's incubating and you're thinking about, oh my gosh, it just starts becoming bigger. Like I visualize it like a balloon. It just starts becoming bigger. And as soon as you talk about it, it's like putting a needle in it. It just takes away the power. So we've been pretty personal in this interview so far, but there is one big area of your personal life that we haven't touched on yet. And that's your husband, Nick Jonas, who you married in 2018. And I hadn't mentioned him until now. That was sort of deliberate because I feel like too often famous women who are married to famous men just end up being defined by their husbands. Is that something you experience and does it frustrate you? Um, It was a very conscious decision I took. Um, I think when I was 19 and I just started joining movies, um, that I, whenever people ask me, who are you dating? Or And I, I think I said it publicly a couple of times too. I was like, you'll know when I'm married because when I've chosen my own person. Um, so for a really long time in my life, I never really spoke about my relationships because I believed it was not for anyone else to know. But my husband's my pride and joy. And I think it is frustrating when, you know, all your... Um, achievements are sort of blindsided by the gossip side of my life or the salacious side of my life, Um, which obviously people are excited about, you know, what my personal life, what my personal life will be, because, you know, we're not very public by nature. But, you know, I I kind of, it's, it's it's a point of frustration, but I also know that in pop culture, in the entertainment business, you know, when you're a public person, that's kind of the curiosity is part of the job. Um, but I have to, in my own way, make sure that I draw the line. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to juggle, but you, you have to be realistic about it. Do you remember when Amal and George Clooney got married and there was that amazing headline that was like, international acclaimed barrister Amal Alamuddin marries actor? Didn't a little part of you secretly want it to be like international global superstar Priyanka Chopra, <laughs> Maris Singer? No, because I'm not competing with my husband. Um, no, because, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel, a, I, I take immense pride in um, the fact that Nick is as multi-hyphenate as probably I am. And, you know, the fact that we both come to the table as creatives and you know we draw on each other to become better every day and um, I think I don't think either one of us is defined by each other Um, I think the media tries to do that more than we do. So let's talk about the future Priyanka because as well as acting you've recently moved into production is that something you see yourself moving more towards and does it come from I don't know, a worry that women don't necessarily get the best roles as they get older. Well, actually, I started my production company about eight years ago um, in India. And uh, we've made about, you know, 12 movies already. And uh, it's nascent in the US. um, I brought it over just about two or three years ago uh, when I found my feet in the industry as an actor. Um, And the reason I started my production house at that time was... Because my mom said to me very astutely at one point that you're in your 30s, you know, all these actors are going to be looking for girls in their 20s to work on, you know, in your ripe old age, you need to figure out another avenue. And as amusing as I found that, um, it was also a reality. And it gave me sort of, a, you know, a business. I've always been very interested in business and it gave me sort of a direction. And that's how the company was founded. And we went local instead of doing really big movies. We did regional movies. We gave opportunities to first time filmmakers, first time actors. You know, my a lot of my movies have won, you know, awards for um, the regional cinema um, that we made. And I was very, I'm very proud of it. And now um, I have a first look deal with Amazon, which I'm creating just stories that I want to tell. And whether those are vehicles for me or vehicles for 
other people um, as actors, directors. What I want to do is I want to grow the table larger. I feel like I really want to um, normalize in Hollywood something that I didn't see when I joined, which was, you know, um, actors that look like me in mainstream entertainment and women behind the camera and women who are writers and directors. And and now that I'm at a place where I've found a solid ground underneath my feet, that's something that I want to be doing. It was such a joy to get an opportunity to speak to Priyanka about imposter syndrome. It's actually so rare to hear an A-list Hollywood star reveal that really some of it is a bit of an act and that they take failure just as hard as the rest of us do. And now, my fellow imposters, it's time for my weekly reminder to follow our podcast in your podcast app and to rate and review it in Apple Podcasts if you use it. Also, if you'd like to access the very best reporting, analysis and commentary from The Telegraph, please visit telegraph.co.uk forward slash imposters, where you can get a free 30-day subscription. Goodbye. Imposters was produced by Maddie Hickish and Theodora Leludis. Sound mixing was by Elliot Lampett, and it was a Listen Entertainment production for The Telegraph. <laughs>